several right. of these people. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All right. Well, it's about seven o'clock now, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, maybe a few more people joining us as we get going here. Um, but I'd like to say hello and welcome uh, to our Exploring Connections webinar series. Uh, my name is Slater Rusa. I know that it says Mark Nutter next to my name, but um, I'm just using his Zoom account currently because uh, he has the subscription uh, to do this kind of thing. So um, Slater, and uh, I work at the Massabesic Center as the education coordinator there. Um, and I'll be kind of helping facilitate um, this evening. Um, before we get rolling, though, I would like to just go through a little bit about um, the New Hampshire Audubon and a little bit about us. Um, so we're going to start off with a, a uh, acknowledgement. So this uh, presentation is streaming to you from our uh, headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, which is located in the site of the ancient village of the Penacook and the Indikina. Uh, which are the traditional ancestral homelands and waterways of the Abenaki, the uh, Penacook, and the Wabanaki peoples, uh, both past and present. Um, I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude uh, the land and waterways and our ancestors, um, the human beings who have stewarded the Indikina throughout the uh, generations for thousands of years. Um, New Hampshire Audubon is odd, uh, honored to continue uh, the stewardship of these lands providing opportunities for all the people um, to form connections to the natural world through our programs and wildlife sanctuaries around the state. Uh, I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence um, of the land you occupy by visiting the website nativeland.ca, um, and I will put that link in the chat momentarily. Um, here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous peoples, uh, and get connected to resources to learn more. Um, and for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the educational resources at indigenousnh.com, uh, including this interactive story map that details the indigenous presence and their stories here in New Hampshire. Now this one here. So uh, thank you for your interest in tonight's topic, which will be uh, old growth forests, biodiversity and garbage storage powerhouses worth saving. Uh, as you may know, this talk is the 21st session of a year long webinar series called Exploring Connections and Stewardship of the Natural World, uh, supported by a New Hampshire Humanities Council grant. Um, the past recordings of these excellent talks can be found on the uh, NH Audubon's YouTube page um, which are also linked on the series webpage. Um, throughout this series, we are exploring the intersection of the sciences, humanities, uh, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. Uh, I want to invite you to really take the time and space to consider how tonight's topic informs, strengthens, or otherwise supports how you would define yourself as a person and how you use this topic to connect with human communities as well as the wild ones. I implore you to reflect on why this topic is important to you and your personal value system and how you can come uh, connect with others uh, throughout this topic in your daily life. Uh, before I hand it over to Diane um, to introduce tonight's presenter, uh, David, David Gavatsky, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to briefly describe how the webinar fits into the larger mission of the New Hampshire Audubon. For those of you who don't know, uh, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental uh, nonprofit organization that is completely independent from the National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars. Uh, connecting people to nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camps, uh, and webinars like these, researching and conserving species uh, in peril and including large raptors, small birds, um, and also managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state uh, for habitat and recreation. 
Um, we also advocate for the sound environmental policy of the New Hampshire State Legislature. Uh, I'm here today because of donors and members like you. We rely on a huge network of volunteers that uh, a huge network of volunteers that assist in our ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you are a volunteer member or supporter of the NH Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. Uh, we simply couldn't achieve our charitable mission without you. Uh, if you would like to become part of our conservation family today, which I hope you will, um, please check out our website for ways to get involved. Um, and I will uh, post some of those links in the chat momentarily. All right, sorry. To get through this part really quick. All right, so please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, and reactions you might have, and reserve the Q&A button for any questions that you would like to be answered by David. Um, it's been great to see the geographical research that we've been able to obtain through these webinars. So for fun, um, and some of you have already done this, uh, you could try typing into the chat where you're from and uh, and uh, that way others can engage with you. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool to see how spread out, you know, we all are. Um, I'd like to give a quick shout out to uh, Diane DeLuca, who is our senior biologist responsible for orchestrating the series. Uh, without her leadership and coordination, this webinar series would not happen. Um, so thank you, Diane. Um, Diane and I will be monitoring the Q&A uh, here in Zoom and um, on Facebook, uh, which we are streaming to live right now. Um, I've set the parameters to the Q&A so that other attendees can uh, see all the questions that are being asked and can comment or upvote the question that they want to see answered. Um, in the event that we have more questions than we have time to answer, uh, this process will help hone in on what questions that we should focus on. Um, that said, don't be shy about asking questions. It's the best way to learn something new. Um, and without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Diane uh, to introduce our uh, presenter tonight. Slater, um, and I want to welcome Slater and thank him for filling in for Mark tonight. Really appreciate that. Um, so we're excited to have David Gavatsky as our speaker this evening. And David is a retired forester and silviculturist, having been employed by the US Forest Service for 33 years. He has visited and studied old growth forests in all parts of North America and has a particular affinity for Alaska's Tongass National Forest. David is the co-author of the recent publication, Forest for the People, the story of the Eastern National Forests and numerous other articles on forest history. He is currently the Old Growth Forest Network County Coordinator for Carroll, Coas, and Grafton Counties. David is also a longtime New Hampshire Audubon member, member and an untiring and generous volunteer. Um, the amount that he has done for New Hampshire Audubon in his volunteer capacity is, is um, really incredible. So we thank him for that. He is an avid birder and continues to work as a naturalist. And he lives with his wife in Jefferson, New Hampshire. And tonight he's gonna to talk about old growth forests and he'll be sharing his knowledge of old growth forests in New Hampshire. And in spite of New Hampshire being the second most heavily forested state in the nation, way less than 1% of New Hampshire forests are considered old growth. So David's presentation will describe the unique characteristics of this forest type and the important value they add to our ecosystem. And so we're really honored to have you tonight, David. So thanks. Well, thank you, Diane. Thank you, Slater. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yes, great. <laughs> great, so welcome everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we're gonna take a journey um, from south to north throughout New Hampshire to look at some of our exemplary old growth forest and some of the topics we're gonna to cover, um, we're gonna cover what is an old growth forest and, and uh, some of the tips to identify what an old growth forest is in the state. And we'll talk about why they're important 
And, um, and Diane mentioned how much old growth forest is left. Well, I'll, I'll mention that again right now. Um, New Hampshire has uh, 4,691,000 acres of forest. And if you look at 1% of that, it would be around uh, 46,000 acres. And so we're well less than half of 1% of old growth forest. And in an ideal situation, we would, we would have a much better um, amount of, of forest in these varying age classes, whether they're um, um, young forest, uh, regenerating forest, and, and, uh, and on up. I, I'd certainly love to see a, a target of 10% uh, in the future. So the tour uh, that we're going to take for the second half of the program is where can we go and see old growth forest in, in New Hampshire? And I'm, I'm really just going to be covering primarily New Hampshire, but um, states like Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maine certainly have some beautiful old growth forest. And I'd be happy to talk about those um, states afterwards. But uh, the focus is really on our connections here in, in New Hampshire. So um, starting off, uh, let's come up with a definition. And it, it's certainly not a perfect definition. And, and I know in the Forest Service and working with other land management agencies, you know, we've We've talked about what is an old growth forest since the late 1970s, and uh, we really haven't come up with an answer that's really definitive because it depends on where you're really at. Because if you're out in the Pacific Northwest or you're in the redwood forest of Northern California, you know, you're talking about trees that live 2000 years. So it's a little bit different, but here for New Hampshire, I came up with a definition and um, it, it works for me, certainly. And I, I call it essentially a natural forest that has developed over a long period of time and generally 150 years or more. And it's not been disturbed by stand replacing events such as logging, windstorms, or forest fires. And there's lots of other names that have been thrown around for old growth forest. Uh, I typically like the term old growth because it really defines the structure a little bit more than some of these other names. Uh, ancient is another one that you often hear. Uh, old forest is, is good. And I know that the, the state of New Hampshire agencies typically use that term. Uh, primeval, virgin. Virgin is probably not a good term because a, a forest that, for instance, uh, had, a, had a forest fire 200 years ago um, and and uh, and started up again. I mean, that was never cut. So we usually figure that a forest that's been cut is is not a virgin forest. So it's just not a great term. Over mature, that that kind of gives a you know a, a slanted viewpoint, just like decadent. Primary forest. You know, a lot of people don't really know what a primary forest is. It's you know first growth as opposed to second growth. And same thing with late successional or late seral. Um, I like legacy forest. I think legacy is, is good because private landowners can, can leave a legacy of, uh, of this. So uh, in looking at the characteristics, if, if we go out and, and take a walk through our woods, there's um, a number of things that we can be looking for. And the first four are really the most important and they consist of large old trees. And I'll be talking about each one of these uh, structural diversity. And snags, a snag is essentially a standing dead tree. Uh, coarse woody debris is, is uh, pretty important, and I'll go into some detail on that. Um, we're, we want to see a, a generally a lack of human disturbance, such as roads or uh, old foundations, uh, agricultural activity, uh, and that. And often we'll see what's called pit and mound topography. It's sometimes called pillow and cradle topography. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, we'll be looking for nurse logs, canopy gaps, uh, trees that are broken topped, and a variety of uh, mosses and liverworts and lichens, these bryophytes that sometimes occupy these really old forests. And then we'll talk about some of the things like cavities and hollow trees and why they're so important for, um, for wildlife. So uh, large old trees as our first slide. This is uh, uh, the old forest in Franconia Notch State Park. This is a um, large yellow birch and you can see that orange thing. That's called a D tape or a diameter tape. And that's pretty much, uh, you know, foresters 
and ecologists in general, they, they love counting things and they love inventorying things. And so that's one of the tools that we use. And so this is certainly a large tree. It's, a, it's an old tree. Um, I didn't actually measure the age of that, but I expect that to be somewhere in the range of 250 years old. And uh, we'll talk more about that particular forest later. So here's some of the tools of the trade that we have. And, um, and one of them is uh, called an increment bore. And it consists of, a, uh, of an extractor, uh, an auger, which has a, a drill-like end and a handle. And you basically drill through, um, through the bark and try to get to the center or the pith of the tree. And you, you count this way. You start in the center and you basically count every one of these dark rings. And, and of course, in tree rings, you, you have, um, you may know this already, but if you don't, I'll, I'll fill you in on that. The late summer or fall wood typically is your dark ring and that early summer growth is, is a lighter color. So you, I like to just count the dark rings and I'll go on out and, uh, and be able to get a number of years to get to that point. And, and of course, that's not the exact answer because it took maybe eight to 10 years for the tree to get up to that particular height. So that's that's what we use. We use an increment bore. I mean, you could use a chainsaw if you had a, a tree that was blown down, I suppose you could, but uh, we typically like using this, uh, this increment bore. And this is, uh, this is what you get. This is the coring uh, that um, is a result. It's you know about the size of a wooden pencil, and this one here is mounted on a, a little wooden case here, so that you can you can glue it in and you can sand it down, so you can see those rings a little bit better. Um, this one was was done by ecologist uh, Chris Kane. He's from um, uh, Concord. He's he's part of our old growth uh, forest network for Merrimack County, and he was doing some work um, at uh, Mount Sunapee State Park in Newberry, New Hampshire. And uh, he was going through there and, and he pretty quickly recognized that this was an unusual forest. And uh, these are the notes he, he took on the back of his, uh, that piece of wood. And it just describes what the tree was um, and that it was a 180 year old uh, red spruce. So uh, Mount Sunapee State Park is, you know, some exemplary old growth trees and forests that are up there. It's been a little bit sliced up by the ski area that's there. So um, uh, Chris was able to identify this and there's been subsequently several studies that have really looked into that. I've, I've hiked up there. Um, it was a place that the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forest, one of their early campaigns was to protect it. And they, they certainly did a, did a good job of it. Um, you don't just um, you know use an increment borer to do it. You can you can also take a look at the bark of the trees. And foresters and ecologists have a have a pretty good idea of um, what tree bark looks like. And there's there's a great book on bark by Michael Wotek um, if you're interested in, in learning more about it. Uh, but this is a black birch on the left, and this trees somewhere between 200 and 250 years old. So uh, it's not the oldest black birch in the world, but uh, it's a pretty old one. And that really platy thick bark that you see there, it's on a talus slope. It's probably keeps a lot of ice and, and, uh, and snow and it tends to be cold for a long period of time. So that tree has been grown there for, you know, a long time since, uh, you know, really the start of the revolutionary war. And that's in Pisgah State Park. It's a, a large state park in the southwest corner of the state uh, near Chesterfield. So, you know, quite a quite a place to go. And on the right, we, you know, who said that you don't have trees grow, uh, money growing on trees? Now, here's a here's an old growth yellow birch that money is actually growing on. It's only because I didn't have a ruler with me, but that's a that's a two dollar bill. Um, showing yellow birch, really, really old platy bark. And again, that's probably in the range of uh, 200 to 250 years of age um, in the Crawford Notch State Park. There's a, there's a wonderful old growth forest there. I'll talk more about that, the Dry River Old Growth Forest. 
Uh, so essentially, large old trees, they're the building blocks of old growth forest. And if you don't have large old trees, and, and a fair number of them, you, you really, it's going to take a little bit more time to, to get into that condition. Uh, this is um, um, uh, Vince uh, Lunetta. We're up at the Lafayette Brook Old Growth Forest. It's in Franconia Notch State Park. There's no trail that goes up to it. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's a, that's a really old yellow birch. It's one of my favorite places to go, but it's a bit of a, a bushwhack to get up into. So old growth forests are often characterized uh, by a complex mix of old trees, young trees, and middle-aged trees. It's, a, it's an uneven aged uh, forest. And, and you can see here, there's, there's several different species that are growing from um, left to right. We have uh, some young beech trees that are growing in, a hemlock, eastern hemlock, uh, and then a yellow birch. And there's another tool over here. This is called, uh, looks like a yardstick. It's called a merit hypsometer. Some people call it a Biltmore stick. And I use that because it's a very rapid way to come up with the diameter of a, uh, of a tree. And you can also use it for height and a number of other things. So uh, it's easier than using your diameter tape to wrap around the tree. Then over here is a sugar maple and you get some spruce trees. So, you know, quite a diversity of, of tree species. This is a mountain pond that's in Chatham, New Hampshire, which is near Conway, the Mount Washington Valley. It's in the White Mountain National Forest and it's a candidate research natural area for the Forest Service. So uh, again, one of my I, favorite places to go, I guess, you know, most of these places are my, my real, really my favorite places. Uh, another one off of uh, Interstate 89 um, is a very interesting one in Bradford. Bradford, New Hampshire has some, some pretty interesting natural areas. They've got a Atlantic white cedar bog um, that they have a trail going out to. Um, and there's a nice tower at the end, you know, fascinating place. But this is this is the Bradford Pines natural area. And I, I mainly wanted to show it because you can see a very large dead tree. These, these dead standing trees are called snags. You know, snag is probably not the best term that's out there because you know you think you you snag your jacket on a on a branch or something. That's somewhat of a uh, pejorative uh, name there, but that's what we use. So use use snags. We're not doing a test here tonight, but uh, that's an example of of what we want to see in the forest. Um, also, hollow trees and um, hollow logs. I mean, they really provide exceptional wildlife habitat. And, and typically old growth forests are uh, just full of them. Uh, this is John Pastore, he's checking out uh, a live but hollow old growth sugar maple on this mountain pond old growth forest on the White Mountain National uh, Forest. Um, pretty interesting that, you know, a variety of uh, animals will use this. And, it, and in a study that was done in 1999, it really talked about the wildlife value and how live trees. And this is mainly for, you know, you as, as um, forest landowners, if you're not going to put your land in, um, you know, forever wild uh, or in an old growth forest, you, you might want to really reconsider about cutting these trees that that have the you know pockets of decay or uh, broken tops and things like that. I mean, we had a lot of broken tops from the ice storm in um, uh, back several years ago. Uh, so they're really important. They really provide some interesting habitat. They're used by many species. You know, we we don't think of these trees with the dead tops. They they but we know about it because we're birders. They use them as uh, resonating towers for, by woodpeckers. Um, Hollow trees are used for roosting by bats and birds and denning, you know, whether it's a porcupine or a raccoon, or in some cases, you'll even have a bear going into, you know, one of those trees, like where you saw uh, John uh, was checking out that one maple tree. You, you could get some, some animals that go in there just to get the protection. So um, I listed the um, information there in that particular report, but uh, there's a huge amount of value in, in live trees that, that are hollow. So different animals, um, you know, love to be in old growth forest. And, and this is the American Martin. Uh, both of these are in the Gibbs Brook scenic area, which is right at the top of Crawford Notch. Uh, you know, the bottom half of this is essentially old growth forest. I didn't include it in the list because uh, 
it, it tends to fade into um, balsam fir and red spruce a little bit higher up that's constantly changing uh, because of uh, fir wave regeneration and such. But um, Martin liked to eat red squirrels. And the places that you're gonna find the red squirrels are in these, these older forests where they're producing lots of, lots of cones. And uh, being an arboreal species or a tree dwelling species, these uh, Martin can, can raise up these trees and, and get as many red squirrels as they want. So um, pretty neat animal. I, I always enjoy seeing them. They're a member of the weasel family. And a little bit more on these hollow trees, why they're important. Uh, here's a American basswood tree. Uh, it's, it's hollow and, and gray squirrels are actually nesting in this one. Uh, this is in the dry river area. Uh, American Beach up in Snyder Brook and Randolph. Again, another example of uh, the trees that you really want to find in these old growth forests because of the, the values that they have. And, and I'll say right up front, you know, if, if you go into an old growth forest, you know, a lot of times the first thing people say is, these are really messy. They need to be cleaned up. There's a lot of dead wood in here. Well, yeah, uh, the beauty is in that messy forest and, and with all that dead wood, because that's where you're gonna be getting that biodiversity and things like cavity trees that are so important for woodpeckers, but a variety of other species that use these cavity trees. So you'll, you'll have a tree that may live for 250, 300 years uh, old, and then it dies, it stands for another 50 years, and then it drops down on the ground, and it's good for 50, 60, 70 more years and contributing to that biodiversity in the ecosystem. So if you had to look at, um, another iconic species of old growth forest, you'd, you'd have to look at the uh, Northern Flying Squirrel. And I think if you're in Southern New Hampshire, you'd be looking at the Southern Flying Squirrel. There are two different species. One likes the uh, more of the hardwood forest. The Northern Flying Squirrel is uh, more adapted, it seems, for coniferous forest. But there's a fair number of them. And they're, they're cavity nesting species. Um, that are actually much more common than you might think. Uh, but the fact that they are strictly nocturnal, uh, you rarely see them unless you disturb a tree when they'll come gliding out at you. They're, they're not actually flying squirrels, they're gliders, but um, that's about the only time you can see them. I've actually gone out in the, uh, in the evening to take my bird feeders in, in in late March because I'm always concerned about bears. And I was just about to, reach for one of the feeders and there was two flying squirrels on it. And I probably would have gotten a pretty good bite had I not looked to see what was there, but they've got those big eyes and uh, really cute. Uh, so they're iconic species of these old growth forests. Another uh, very important thing that you need to have is, is dead woody materials in, in various uh, stages of decomposition. You want to have sound logs, but you want to have these rotting logs, large branches. And, and uh, this is called coarse woody debris, or CWD. And we define coarse woody debris as anything that's three inches in diameter and up. And, and this log, as you can see here, and I... Um, as probably a 30 inch diameter log. You can see my D tape here. That's gonna be around for 50, 60, 70 years, providing life for a lot of, uh, lot of species. This is in the Dry River Old Growth Forest in Crawford Notch State Park. Uh, what's interesting about Dry River, you, many of you probably know that uh, uh, in the National Forest, there's the Presidential Range Dry River Wilderness. And this is a you know, wilderness area designated by Congress. And so oftentimes you think wilderness, well, this is the place to go because this is where the trees have never been cut. Well, actually the Forest Service part of it was, was cut in the 1890s. It was um, the Saco Valley Lumber Company had a logging railroad that went up there for several years and, and they pretty much logged everything. But the reason this forest survived, this is in Crawford Notch, State Park was that the state of New Hampshire uh, decided to acquire it in 1911. They purchased it in 1913 and it hadn't been logged. And uh, so it's a, just an amazing forest um, if you get a chance to go out and see it. So here's um, 
what foresters and ecologists use when they're looking at and they're doing a forest inventory. And this is not on the test at the end here, but this just talks about the decomposition um, categories for, for both snags, uh, those standing dead trees, and for um, the coarse woody debris. And you know the class four logs or class five logs were de decomposing. And you know, as a scientist, as a forester, or as an ecologist, you, you, you need to know when you're doing these surveys, you're filling out these forms and you're putting this information in. And so this will give you a, a picture of what this particular forest is like when you put it all together. So just thought you might want to see that. So coarse woody debris, as I said, three inches in diameter and above, fine woody debris is one to three inches. Um, very, very important for wildlife habitat. And so, yes, it, it looks messy and it's not. It's really incredible habitat for, for wildlife. So that's what you want. Uh, between a third and a half of amphibians and mammals use these older forests for some part of their life. Uh, there's no wildlife species that we know that is um, specifically um, adapted for an old growth forest here in, in the Northeast. I mean, we've talked about the spotted owl in the Pacific Northwest, and there's some other species out there. But here in the East, it's, um, it's just part of that biodiversity hotspot. Uh, amphibians and, and mammals that, that go here at some stage in their life cycle. And also birds. These old growth forests are very, very important for birds. So this is a red eft. And um, this is a nurse log uh, that's in Snyder Brook, which is in Randolph, New Hampshire. It's, it's, a, it's a forest that was never cut. Um, it was acquired in 1896 by the Appalachian Mountain Club. And in 1936, they donated it to the uh, people of uh, the United States through the US Forest Service. So it's now the Snyder Brook Scenic Area. It's very close to the highway. It's one of the easiest old growth forests to walk to and uh, pretty spectacular. It's, it's only 600 feet wide and about a half a mile long, uh, but it really shows you what this forest was like before we arrived and, and changed everything. But this picture here shows you lots of uh, different kinds of moss. Uh, you can see some yellow birch and spruce and hemlock that's growing on here. These logs contain a huge amount of moisture. So they're very, very important. They just soak up a lot of water. They provide ideal seed beds for um, a number of species. And here's another one. There's, a, there's an old growth forest at Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge, uh, about 55 acres. And, and on the right, you can see a stump here. Uh, this was a, a uh, white spruce, uh, which is common um, in this part of the state. It had fallen down, blown down probably. And there's a number of trees that are actually growing right on this, this nurse log. And some of the trees that's in this Pondicherry old growth forest they're over 100 feet tall, uh, 40 inches in diameter. So pretty spectacular to, to see that. Um, another thing, you'll, you'll often be walking through the woods, and this is a, a stump here. This was not cut. This is at the Pisgah State Park. Uh, it's a hemlock tree. I, I know you can, can't really quite see it, but these stumps and these nurse logs provide important uh, habitat for trees when the seeds get there because of the moisture that's there, because of the nutrients that are readily available. There's a lot more sunlight that's up on these logs or stumps. And so these trees tend to do pretty well. But after a while, once the stump rots away 20, 30 years later, you end up with what we call stilt roots. Uh, that's that's left. There's there's some other names, but I like to call it stilt roots because it looks like the tree is growing on stilts. And you've probably seen that before. Uh, here's another example. Um, this is in the Lafayette Brook old growth forest. Um, you can see the former stump right in here. It's a huge yellow birch, and um, and this stump rotted away, and so so you have a hollow that's in here. That's uh, just really important for wildlife. Uh, another thing that you will see in old growth forest are what are called canopy gaps. And if you're a 
person that likes to go through old growth forest and, and exploring them off trail, you'll learn that uh, they're not the easiest thing to go through because typically we're a tree, in this case here, it busted off probably in a windstorm. You get all of this regeneration that's coming in and often is really quite thick and you have to make your way through it. And, and uh, sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do, but these canopy gaps are so important because this is where the young trees, the new forest is going to be coming in. And they range in size, you know, from a 20th of an acre where one tree is, has come down to sometimes you'll, you'll have larger gaps of, uh, of an acre or so. Um, and, and this is what we call pit and mound topography. And I have a couple pictures here. This just shows you how uneven the ground is. Um, it's because sometimes these trees get blown over in the wind and they, they tip over. And let's take a look at uh, a tree that is blown over. We call it wind throw or a, a blowdown. Um, so the tree has been blown down. This was a, a red maple. And you see a mound over here develop, and then you see a pit. And these pits often will get water. There'll be a lot moisture. Um, and so they're kind of a, a micro refugia for, for various plants and animals. And so again, it's that, that, that habitat that's there. And then this is the mound. Uh, sometimes they call it uh, a pillow and cradle, I typically like to use the term pit and mound, and I, I've kind of grown up with that, so that's that's what I use. Uh, again, here's an example. You see a tree had, had tipped over, um, and then it created a gap in the canopy, so enough sunlight came in so that our state tree, the, um, the white birch, came in here, and you see some other regeneration, and then you have this pit down here, which typically has more water and it's probably going to be good habitat for salamanders and so forth. Um, so this pit and mound topography, uh, when you see it, it pretty much indicates that there was no agriculture here. And, and because typically if farmers came in and they cleared the forest, uh, you know, they would level this out. Uh, they would get rid of all the stumps, the rocks, and it would be uh, you know, fairly flat, particularly if there were crops. You'd probably see some stone walls, and particularly if it was used for food crops, they'd be very small stones in the uh, stone walls. If it was just used for pasture land, it would just be the larger stones to keep the, uh, the cows and the sheep that are uh, inside those, those areas. So to me, in this case, this forest has not had any agriculture in, in it. Uh, but just because you have, um, you know, big trees doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're really old. Uh, here's an example in Pisgah State Park. I was down there a couple weeks ago and I took this picture of suppressed eastern hemlock. And these trees are about five feet tall. They have flat tops. Hemlocks can live in the understory for 150 years or more and just grow very, very slow. And then when a couple of these trees fall over or die, all that sunlight comes in and they just take off. So um, just because you have some small trees in there doesn't mean that they're particularly old. And I know that these have been studied and some of these are up to 150 years old. You have to use a microscope to uh, really look at the tree rings on these really very small trees here. Uh, I mentioned trees with broken tops on why they're important. And again, these are places where bats are gonna uh, tend to roost at night. Uh, things like potentially even, you know, chimney swifts you might get uh, and, and other birds that are gonna go in there to get out of the weather and, and also to spend the, spend the nights in there. You can um, see a variety of, of uh, what are called bryophytes, and those include mosses, lichens, and liverworts. Um, and here's just two examples, uh, necaria, or what we call shingle moss. This is on a, um, on a hemlock tree. This is pretty common in old growth forest here in New Hampshire, and, and that's in Big Pines Natural Area. I'll talk about that, that a little bit more about that later. And then uh, one of the usnea, species. Uh, there's also a, another one that is a distinctive uh, for old growth forest. 
that's occasionally found. But this is old man's beard lichen. This is at Pondicherry. And this is in a um, area of black spruce that, that probably was never cut because it's just too wet, too hard to get into. And those trees are 140, 150 years old. So those lichens are, are pretty important indicators. They're indicators of good air quality too. So lichens are, are great bio indicators. Uh, here's an example. You may have read the, the book uh, by Suzanne Samard, uh, um, Finding the Mother Tree. And, and she's been credited uh, with this idea for this wood wide web, not the world wide web, but the wood wide web, these mycorrhizal networks that are in the soils between you know, various trees. And so, so you have a yellow birch on the left and you have a hemlock tree that's essentially grafted together. And there's a lot of discussion that they actually share some of the nutrients and um, you know, these important connections in here. So I really recommend if, if you're looking for a good book to read or to listen to, get um, Suzanne Samard's book on finding the mother tree. She's a, a silviculturist and forester from British Columbia, a very important scientist who's done some amazing work. So that's at Big Pines Natural Area in, in Tamworth. So decomposers are really important to find on, um, that you're gonna see these in old growth forest. And, and this year in particular was a great year for mushrooms and other kinds of fungus. And uh, you see coral mushrooms and, and honey mushrooms growing on trees. And, and obviously this is a, a sign of decay, but uh, it's returning these trees back into the, into the soil. Um, looking at some of the birds that are really important and particularly the pileated woodpecker, probably the iconic species for um, New Hampshire or even New England old growth forest. It's, it really likes these larger trees um, and searching for carpenter ants and various uh, other food items in these dead and, and dying trees. Um, but another species is um, the brown creeper and the brown creepers is actually gaining an importance um, for, um, for being found in these old growth forests. And, and they're pretty characteristic because of the, you know, the, set, the, the bark is so uneven. It's not the smooth bark that you typically see in these, in these younger trees. Uh, so um, the brown creeper, very important old growth forest species, as is the winter wren. Um, two pictures of them. The winter wrens love to use these, these uh, tip-up mounds for nesting habitat, for foraging, and, and just finding uh, out there. So um, you'll probably certainly hear them. And, and, and then, of course, um, these older spruce fir forest um, and pine forest will produce a lot of food uh, that uh, like this red crossbill or white wing crossbills will be going for. So uh, you have a variety of um, ogre of forest types. Um, a lot of us, you know, really love the, um, uh, the, the northern hardwood forest, which is a sugar maple, yellow birch, American beech. And then there's a northern hardwood spruce variant and a northern hardwood hemlock variant and so you even have more diversity in that and but of course i'll be talking a little bit about some of the um, old growth spruce and fir forests that we have throughout the state of uh, new hampshire and these are the places that you're going to see these very interesting boreal species um, and another bird that's probably um, one of the most important uh, birds to use old growth forest is the black Bernian warbler and the studies in Pennsylvania have shown that um, uh, these Blackburnian warblers prefer these mature and, and, and older forest uh, 45 times as much as, as younger forest. So you're gonna find them up in, the, uh, up in the canopy of the hemlock trees and, and the spruce trees. Uh, and we'll be revisiting them, I think in April and late April and May when they, they start returning from the tropical region. So beautiful bird, um, great place to find them is in the old growth forest. Um, let me talk a little bit about old growth forest and, um, 
and climate change because there's a, some very interesting connections and, and it's a complicated topic. We could probably spend a couple evenings just discussing it, but uh, there's two terms that you really should know about. And one is carbon sequestration and the other is carbon storage. And, and sequestration, um, you know, it's, it's battered around quite a bit, but it's essentially the process of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for use in photosynthesis. And, and that's what plants do. That's what uh, um, you know, phytoplankton in the ocean does. So it's important. So sequestration is a rate at which a forest sequesters or takes in this, this carbon uh, over time. It, it really changes over time. So it, it typically peaks, it goes fairly quickly. Um, up to around 30 to 70 years and, and continues to do it, they continue to sequester it. Um, so it's important. But what the old growth forests do is, is, is they actually um, have a greater amount of, of carbon that's retained in this carbon pool in the forest. And so storage levels increase and they typically peak when the, when the forests are trees around 200 years of age, but they, they still do it because the one thing about a, a 10 year old tree and a, and a, a 200 year old tree is, is the amount of leaves on a uh, older tree. Is, it, it's just a greater mass of leaves. So they're certainly doing a lot more uh, of the sequestering and the storing. And so when we look at old growth forests, we, we know that they are storing a large amount of carbon and it's imperative that um, we cool the planet down. Planet Earth has a fever and we need to cool it down. And, and one of the ways to do it is to um, keep trees growing, especially bigger trees. Um, I'm not saying not to go logging or anything like that because we, we rely on, on forest products. They're very important, but uh, so many times in, in my experience in, in uh, laying out timber sales and, and things like that, um, that uh, uh, you, know, you, can, you can do it in some areas, but 90% uh, of your problems often come from 10% of the area that you're working in and you'd be much better off just to leave those areas that are too hard to log, too close to the streams, you know, just leave them and, and put them in a um, old growth component. So that's my advice, um, you know, work with the, the forests that are a little bit easier to get at and, and protect these older, older trees. One of the findings that came out in 2019, this is uh, Professor Bill Keaton uh, from the University of Vermont, uh, in a study that, that came out was older forests in Eastern North America are less vulnerable to climate change than younger forests, particularly for carbon storage, timber production, and biodiversity. Uh, so it's an interesting study. I, I put it in the uh, resource list that will we'll go out to all of you um, when we're going to be sending out the, uh, the recording of this. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a tour throughout um, the old growth forest in New Hampshire. I'm gonna start with uh, one of the smaller ones, and this is the Chesterfield Gorge in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. It's not the Chesterfield Gorge in Massachusetts, which is another beautiful location, but this is a, a 15 acre, it's a really small, really a remnant track, but it's very interesting. Um, and you can see some of the importance of this forest. There's some, there's some large hemlock trees that are really quite old. And there's a ravine that you go through, they call it a, a gorge actually. And, and these old forests, because there's so much shade in here, um, it's cooling the stream down, which is so important for cold water streams that we have our Eastern brook trout and other aquatic species. So again, they're performing this hydrology function of uh, keeping water cool. And they're also dropping branches and logs into the stream, which tends to improve the habitat for um, a lot of the, the fish that are there. You're creating these pools and, and oxygenating the water uh, even more so. Chesterfield Gorge, again, it's a tiny one. It's near Keene. If you haven't been there, the um, New Hampshire State Parks has a really nice trail that goes down through there. It's about seven tenths of a mile long. It's a interesting forest. It's got uh, hemlock, uh, beech, oak, and pine 
uh, that's that's in here. Very yeah, typical classic uh, southern New Hampshire type of a, of a forest that you have down there. Again, um, I mentioned Mount Sunapee, which is in Newberry, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, Vicki and John here with uh, standing by an old growth red spruce. Uh, it's a it's a mixed type of forest. It's a uh, uh, yellow birch, sugar maple, American beech, and and uh, a lot of these really really big uh, red spruce trees that are there. Uh, the the uh, red berries that you see there's uh, it's the viburnum. It's called hobble bush. Um, took this picture. I think it was in October when we were out there visiting. Another interesting place is uh, in Hanover, uh, New Hampshire. If, if you ever go into uh, Lebanon or Hanover, or White River Junction, Vermont area, uh, check out Pine Park. Uh, it's in the resource list where you can, where you can uh, get a map from the Pine Park Association. There's some interesting trails that uh, go through here. Um, this is one, I can't remember the name of the path here. It's kind of so the goat path or something. It's right along the Connecticut River. Uh, I'm not sure I'd recommend doing it in the middle of winter without micro spikes because uh, you don't want to slide off into the river. But there's uh, there's certainly other trails that are out there. There's a uh, Girl Brook Gorge. I think I have a picture of that. Uh, yes, this is Girl Brook Gorge. Um, there's a newly rebuilt trail, uh, Jim Kennedy had uh, been working in, in that area. He's a landscape architect and he sent me this picture. Uh, thanks Jim for the, for the photo. Um, and again, it just shows you the importance of these old growth forests and protecting water quality in this particular stream. And this is, this is downtown Hanover, New Hampshire. And there's, there's parking uh, by the old Hanover uh, Country Club there. So check out the, um, the page on the resource list. So if you're in Hanover, you're close to Hanover, I would definitely take a walk through here because it's such a uh, neat forest and, and such a neat college town. So there I am. I'm I'm with, um, I think Chris Martin from Audubon and I were out checking the Bradford Pines. And, and this was donated by, by Timber Company, Simmons Timber Company, I think in 1951. Uh, there's some huge Eastern white pine there that, uh, um, that it's just fascinating. It's not a big area. It's maybe only five or six acres. But again, I wanted to put it in there because I wanted to have a geographic distribution of these um, old growth forests throughout the state of New Hampshire because there's there's something something around there for for everyone. We're trying to figure out where we could at least find one really interesting old growth forest per county. And so we're looking forward to your advice and help and in, in finding that we're. Uh, you know, for Rockingham and some of the other counties that uh, in the southeast part of the state, we may have a little more difficulty, but we're thinking Pawtuckaway State Park is going to have some uh, really good places. So here's, uh, here's one of the ones that, that's really a neat place. It's in Hemingway State Forest in Tamworth. It's called the Big Pines Natural Area. It's about 108 acres that was set aside. Um, just a beautiful forest. There's a um, our old growth forest network group um, that we're out taking a hike and, and we were just in awe. And you know, one of the values of, of these old growth forests and, and particularly in the age of uh, COVID is that, you know, just getting outside and getting around these big trees and, and, and taking in the aromas that these pines and, and fir trees and spruce trees put out, it, it just makes you feel so good. So it's a you know, tremendous value for that. But um, uh, so here we are in the hike. Uh, Chris is using this merit hypsometer. Um, it's a huge old hemlock tree. And, and, and there's some really, really big trees. And, and I'm a, one of the volunteers for the uh, New Hampshire Big Tree Program that's run by University of New Hampshire Extension. And, um, and so this is a place that uh, you really want to go if you want to see some of the, some of the big trees in Carroll County. Uh, Christine Tappan and uh, Sarah Rob Grieco from, um, she's from Vermont. She's the old growth uh, forest network coordinator for, um, for, the, uh, for New England. And so we were out there and pretty impressive. This tree was 58 inches in diameter, which I think if I did the math, somewhere around 12 feet around, but it's over 150 feet tall. And so when you're walking on this trail, 
uh, and you see this tree and you look up, it just, it touches the sky. And there's so many of these other big trees that are out there at, uh, at Big Pine. So it's, it, it's quite the place. And plus, you can take this trail that goes up to um, a fire tower. It's, it's maybe another half a mile uh, up there on the Hemingway State Forest. So definitely worth doing. Uh, another one, this is in the White Mountain National Forest, a Waterville Valley area. This is uh, the Greeley Ponds Scenic Area. And this was um, acquired by petition from the people of Waterville Valley and actually the people of, from New Hampshire in 1927. There was originally going to be a logging railroad that was going to connect uh, to, well, essentially where the Kankamaugus Highway is. So this is the trail going up to the old growth forest. Pretty easy trail from, from the Kangamagas Highway. But this is Greeley Ponds. This is an old growth forest. They, yes, it was damaged a little bit in 1938 in that hurricane, but it's largely come back. And this lower part is just some amazing northern hardwood forest. And you can see some uh, pretty large spruce trees that go all the way on up here. Um, Mount Osceola would be behind me where I took this picture. And these logs that are in here, and these, I don't know how long these logs have been here, but there's, there's no saw marks. They just trees that have fallen into the water and they're there for a long period of time, but it's just spectacular. And the notch is called Mad River Notch. And I'm just glad that they did not put a logging railroad through this area here because it, it would have never been the same. I'm, I'm thankful for the uh, the Society of Protection New Hampshire Forest and the citizens of Waterville Valley who petitioned the federal government to acquire this. And, and when the White Mountain National Forest was being you know, created, it was the Weeks Act 1911 and then 1914, they started buying land, but they were primarily buying land that was cut over, burned over, and they could get the best price per acre, and, you know, typically $3 an acre. But to buy this land from you know, a timber company who really wanted to cut it, um, you know, they had to pay full price, which is, you know, $10, $11 an acre. I can't remember. It might be $10.50 an acre in 1927. That's, that's pretty good price in those days if, if, if you do the compound interest um, and the inflation rates. So uh, I'm just glad it's here. So get a chance. You want to take a, you know, two mile hike out to a, a wonderful pond. Even in the winter time, there's a cross country ski trail that, that goes out there um, and, and you can really enjoy it. This is a Northern white cedar that's growing right here. Kind of interesting to see that. So um, I was out there with Jamie Lewis. Uh, he's the lead historian with the Forest History Society. Uh, he was here uh, visiting and uh, he wanted to see some of the old growth. And so we went up to, to Greeley Ponds and some painted trilliums uh, were you know, late flowering because we were a little bit higher in elevation and in these old growth forests, they stay a lot cooler. There's a lot more moisture. And so these, these flowers were coming in pretty late. So Jamie's down at Duke University. Uh, another one that, uh, uh, this was a you know, fairly recent picture, I think about a month ago, uh, we took a trip up to Mountain Pond it's a candidate research natural area with the Forest Service. It's in Chatham, uh, New Hampshire. Uh, it, it's, near, it's near North Conway, essentially. Uh, easy trail. It's only three-tenths of a mile walk in. And, and, and looking at the, at the records, I, have, I went through some of the files uh, in the land acquisition records. And again, it was around $10 an acre. It was a, um, a couple of sisters who owned the property and they, they sold it to the um, uh, White Mountain National Forest and it is spectacular. Another spectacular place, you know, I, I, I love all of these places and, and I, I've always loved trees. So this is the Dry River Old Growth Forest. This is in Hart's location or you probably know it better as uh, Crawford Notch, Crawford Notch State Park. Um, it, you, you know, many of you drive through Route 302 uh, through Crawford Notch and you're, you know, you're looking at the high mountains on both sides, but as you're driving through, you're driving through an old growth forest and pretty much the same with Franconia Notch, you're driving through the Franconia Notch Parkway, the interstate route, that's, that's old growth forest that's through there and I'll show you some of the pictures of that. So, you know, you park your car 
near the trail, right at the trailhead for um, the Dry River Trail, and you know you walk in a few hundred feet, you're you're in big tree country, big sugar maple, yellow birch, white ash, basswood, red oak, and uh, and other species that are in there. So it just was never cut. A uh, you know I thought about this area if I should put it in, but uh, this is actually the largest old growth forest that we have in New Hampshire. It's the Nancy Brook Research Natural Area, but it's a nine mile, maybe nine and a half mile round trip from um, Crawford Notch and Route 302 to get up there, but it is pretty spectacular. Um, it's an area that the Forest Service research branch is using. They're studying high elevation ponds. This is Nancy Pond. There's also Norcross Pond, but um, as the view from Mount Nancy, it just shows you this, this area. It's about 1,500 acres in size, and it's a red spruce, uh, balsam fir, black spruce, old growth forest that has never been cut. So I guess, you know, technically you call this a virgin forest. Um, it just is a, an amazing place. It's a place where, uh, you know, if you want to find spruce grouse, Black-backed woodpeckers, potentially American three-toed woodpeckers, and that it's it's boreal habitat. So um, a gorgeous place to go, but it is it is a long walk to get in there. Um, this is the old forest in um, Franconia Notch, and my resource list has has a brochure that the um, uh, New Hampshire State Parks has put out. It's, it's put out by the Natural Heritage Bureau. So you can see this is the, the trailhead at the Lafayette um, Brook Campground, Lafayette Place. Uh, it's the trailhead that goes up to Lonesome Lake. And it's also, this is the bike path. So this is a super easy trail to walk on. The bike path uh, goes right through this old forest and the brochure that you can you can get online, you know, just describes all of these really neat ecological features in this old growth forest. And uh, the only thing you have to be careful for is, uh, you know, people on bicycles or in the wintertime on snowmobiles. But uh, you know, you're walking through there, and you can go to the basin, and then you can even park at the basin and come up that way. So it's a it's a great forest if if you only have uh, you know an hour or two. And you want to get regenerated by seeing these massive old trees that have survived for centuries. This is a, this is a great place to go. And also in um, Franconia Notch, this is right at the top. This is um, Echo Lake over here and the interstate. Cannon Mountain is just off to the right here. This is what we call the Lafayette Brook old growth area. And this is Eagle Cliff. It's a place where apparently golden eagles used to nest and uh, Mount Lafayette, Franconia ranges over here. This is all old growth forest. And the reason this is old growth forest, there used to be a hotel here called the Profile House and they did not want their view shed uh, altered by the kind of logging that was going on in, in the uh, early part of the history up here. So um, you wanna take this exit and there's a side road that goes down to the U Galen Wayside area, but you can walk into the woods anywhere here and you will be amazed at the size of the sugar maple, yellow birch, and the hemlock and, and spruce. So it, it's pretty much on this side and on this back side here. And then Lafayette Brook comes up. I think I have a picture of Lafayette Brook. Yeah, coming up here. So it's on, on the left side of this picture is all national forest that was acquired uh, you know, fairly early on, 1914. This side, had been uh, owned by the hotel, but it was acquired by the people of New Hampshire in 1927. And this had never been cut. This had not only been cut, but there had been a forest fire that had burned over this, on up the ridge to Skookum Chuck Ridge and over Mount Garfield. And it's a lot of white birch and, uh, and the forest is a little over a hundred years old. So, so again, state park on the right, national forest on the left, the old growth is, is in the state park and uh, goes quite a ways up through here, but uh, pretty cool place to go and see. Um, I mentioned earlier this one in Randolph, this is Snyder Brook, the scenic area, the Appalachian Mountain Club bought it because the whole northern presidentials were being cut over and the AMC uh, 
uh, it was their first acquisition and they spent several hundred dollars on this to protect this forest and several waterfalls that are along here. And uh, it's a magnificent hemlock, spruce, northern hardwood forest that you go through here. Pretty easy walking. I think it's maybe an elevation change and a half a mile of three or 400 feet in elevation. Pretty easy. You can go up one side and down the other, but I generally recommend people stay on, on, the, on the one side. There's a river crossing that can be a little little tricky at times. So stay on the, on the brook side. Gorgeous, uh, gorgeous forest. And of course, we, you know, we think about the wilderness areas. There's 130,000 acres of wilderness on the White Mountain National Forest. These are congressionally designated. And this was the first one. Uh, when the Wilderness Act was passed in 1964 by US Congress, uh, the Great Gulf was um, designated already by the Forest Service as what's called a wild area. And they still have that designation, but uh, in this case, it automatically became designated as a wilderness. And it's about 5,500 acres um, uh, in this, in this huge, you know, what's called the Great Gulf, this glacial ravine that extends from Mount Washington, Mount Jefferson, and uh, Adams and over into Madison here. Uh, but even though it's about 5,000 acres, this is the head wall here. Um, I do a lot of plant surveys on the head wall here, and it's, it's a little uh, precarious in some of the places, but there's not a lot of forest here, but, but there is some uh, Spalding Lake down here, and there's actually a trail that runs down the Great Gulf Headwall Trail. And so there is some old growth, but it's, it's mostly fir trees in here, but um, uh, still you know, worth going to. It's a difficult hike from Route 16 up to the summit of Mount Washington this way, but you will travel through some interesting habitat. And finally, um, you know, the last preserve I wanted to mention, that's, that's an old growth forest. This is the New Hampshire chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Um, they um, had a donation from the Champion Timber Company. It's, it's just a great story. Uh, this is called uh, East Inlet Norton Pool. It's in Pittsburgh. I know some of you have probably gone up there. And the access, I mean, you can walk in, but it's really, really, really difficult, even for a person who spent their life in their woods, like myself. I go in by canoe or kayak. Um, uh, there's a boat landing, and, and you can go in. And it's a um, black spruce, tamarack, uh, balsam fir forest uh, that's old growth. And it, it was protected by, by two foresters who, um, you know, they, you know they, they knew this, there was wood out there, but they had a lot of um, forest land that they were dealing with. And they, they just never wanted to see this cut because it was such a special area. And then when um, it, it, it came to be that Champion Timber Company donated it to the Nature Conservancy. And so now it's protected, it's about 400 acres in size. And it is an amazing place to see blackback woodpeckers, like I say, spruce grouse, boreal chickadees, Canada jays, and of course, loons. And, uh, you know, I've seen great blue herons that are perched on the top of these trees, which are pretty crazy too, and bald eagles and, and that. So if you want to see wildlife in Pittsburgh, East Inlet, Norton Pool, that's the place to go. So uh, in conclusion here, I just wanted to, again, why are old growth forests so important? They just really are biodiversity powerhouses. There's uh, a lot of carbon storage that uh, goes on in these old growth forests. They're very important for, for streams and, and water quality, and they store water in these down logs that in some cases, it's the only place in these dry periods that you're gonna find you know, moisture in these, these logs that are rotten. Uh, there's great opportunities for scientific study and to use as reference sites to see, you know, how best to manage our other lands that we are actively uh, doing our timber harvesting in. And so, of course, there's important cultural and social aspects to this. And, and, and the word recreational, if you really go back in the old English, and it really originates from, from the Latin is uh, to, to re, to do over, uh, to recreate. And, and that value that you have um, in, in many ways, spiritual value that when you go into these old growth forests, you can really 
really appreciate standing there than knowing that these trees have been there for over 300 years and, and, and the things that, that have gone by that they've gone through. And so they really deserve to be protected. We need to go for, you know, above that one half of 1% and to really strive towards that 10% goal. Uh, because they they are so important for for biodiversity and uh, and that but uh, if you get a chance you know certainly get out and and enjoy one of these areas and, and walk the trails um, we're hoping in 2023 two years from now we're going to have an old growth conference we're working with unh extension the forestry people um, and others to to host a conference somewhere in the White Mountains. And uh, we're gonna have a, a number of field trips that would take you out to some of these places and you can learn you know, a lot more. Uh, you know, I could certainly go on for, for many more hours on um, you know, the values of these uh, old growth forests. But uh, for now, I will um, wish you uh, that, uh, you know, taken away from, from Star Wars here, may the forest be with you. So thank you folks. And um, we'll um, see if there's any questions. Thanks, Dave. That was, that was great. Really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge. Um, I'm showing that my internet connection is unstable. So hopefully you can still hear me. <laughs> I can hear you, yes. And yeah, hopefully okay, you can great. hear me for the last hour too. <laughs> yeah, no, you came through great. Um, so th there are a lot of great resources that that um, different participants have shared in the chat. So make sure everyone goes to the chat and you can actually save your chat if you're wanting to just scroll down to the bottom and you can save the chat and then you will have all of those resources um, in a file. But we appreciate that so many people dropped resources into the chat. And maybe speaking of that, Dave, we'll just, there was um, Mary Tebow Davis put in a way to get in touch if you're interested in the Big Tree program. I didn't know if you wanted to share just a little bit more about what that program is. Oh, thanks for doing that, Mary. Um, Mary is associated with the UNH Extension, one of her programs that uh, she works with is the Big Tree Program. This is a group of uh, volunteers, as I said, I, I'm one of them. Um, and it's organized essentially at the county level with the uh, UNH Extension Forestry Educator. Uh, and, and we go out and we look for the biggest trees. And it's kind of a fun activity. We usually do it as a group uh, activity. We, we, there's a website. And you can see what the um, uh, the biggest trees are. It's a it's a point uh, score that we use, and it's essentially um, we we measure the circumference in inches uh, at at breast height, which is four point five feet. So that gives you a certain number of points, and then we measure the height using various tools. You learn how to use different measuring tools. And we do that in feet, which gives us another point. And then we measure the average crown spread using a 100 foot tape in two di directions. And we come up with a, a score for that. So for instance, um, um, you know, we have all of these different uh, species of trees. I think there's about 70 trees that are native to New Hampshire. We have some of the non-native trees. And, uh, and we have some national champions. We have, uh, for instance, a national champion, uh, white spruce in Whitefield, uh, appropriately enough, and, and some other national champions around. So it's a fun activity to get into. Um, it's uh, a low cost way to get out in the woods and, and really learn a lot more about, uh, about trees. So um, Mary posted a, a um, information on, on that website. Thanks, Dave. Um, just following up on that, could you share a little bit more about how the um, old growth forests that have already been determined were found or how that process works? And I know that you're working to, to identify more areas. Well, it's, it's, it's complicated because, you know, really interest in old growth forest there's probably always some, but it really came to a forefront in the late 1970s and 1980s when um, 
you know, in the words of Joni Mitchell in the uh, big yellow taxi, you don't know what you have until it's gone. And, and so much of the old growth forest was being cut that there uh, in the scientific community and uh, in the naturalist community, they said, you know, there's something, you know, pretty unusual. We need to start saving these things. So people started coming together. Uh, Lee Carboneau, and I think it was 1986, that got a master's degree and um, from the University of New Hampshire and did a, a study of the old growth forest. And, and that was one of the major um, studies which, which found a number of, of places. And then plant ecologists and botanists, they, they knew about these other places. And in the case of the Forest Service, you know, they, they've been keeping records since the forest was established in 1914. So, you know, we, we knew about those and, uh, you know, but the, there's been some others, you know, the, it was generally not recognized, uh, for instance, that the Dry River uh, had an old growth forest that, you know, I, I know it's over hundred acres in size, uh, until Tom Wessels uh, was doing some work in there. He, he wrote a book called uh, Roadside Ecology, 30 of the Best uh, Natural Sites to Visit in New England. And one of the chapters is on the um, uh, Dry River Forest. And, you know, it's, he, he found the, you know, a real winner. And then others have been going on. I found an area at Pondicherry. Uh, uh, Chris uh, Kane found that, uh, or recognized that I should say, that there was an old growth forest on, on Sunapee that was pretty, pretty extensive. And then, you know, groups like Harvard Forest have been working at Pisgah State Park and, and others. And, um, and, and I think, you know, in general, citizens, I think, can, can find some of these places too, with the tools that I provided, some of the books that, um, uh, that are available from Tom Wessels. He's, he's got one called Forest Forensics that really goes into a lot of detail on, on finding these things. So that's, that's one way. And of course, you know, we're also using uh, aerial imagery, you know, Google Earth and, and that, and, and, and we can, you know, just sit at our computer. And if we think we have an area, we can, we can look at the, at the canopy of the forest and we can enlarge and so forth. And we can see if there's gaps in there. And so this is kind of a screening method. And then we can go in on the ground and see if it has those characteristics that we're, we're looking for. Great. Um, I'm assuming that in some of your resources, you'll talk about if people are wanting to get involved in some of these old growth projects or the networks, that uh, there's a place that they can go. Yes, uh, it's it's on that resource list. There's a couple of organizations. And I mean, in addition to the Big Tree Program and the Natural Resource Stewards Program that um, Marriott is also involved in, uh, UNH Extension has a, has a number of um, activities, nature groupie being one of them. Um, but that resource list will, will have a lot of that information. Now, the two organizations, I mentioned the Old Growth Forest Network, its uh, uh, headquarters is in Maryland. It's a um, uh, national nonprofit. And, and what they're doing is, is working with volunteers like myself and, uh, and others that you saw in the slide program uh, to, to try to uh, find these forests, inventory them, and to work on designating at least one per county in, in the country. And not every county obviously even has trees uh, or forest by any means, but um, I believe in New Hampshire, we can certainly have uh, all 10 counties represented in it. And we're, we're moving along to try to uh, designate this. I mean, it's a, it's a voluntary thing. Um, and, and the main thing is that uh, you have you know, public access, you have some kind of a trail and that you agree not to you know, log it. If you, know, you change your mind, you know, that's, that's up to you, but you lose the designation. So uh, that's what we're doing. And then there's another organization, I, I, um, Northeast Wilderness Trust, they're out of Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, that I think is the only organization that actually works with landowners where you, if you want to have a legacy forest and you want to you know, protect it, um, you can have a forever wild clause and, and, um, and do that donation. So the information on both of those organizations is there. And of course, New Hampshire Audubon, uh, Nature Conservancy, Forest Society, and, and the local land trust in, that we have in New Hampshire and other groups you know, are actively working um, now that we've recognized old growth as, a, as an important component. So work locally and work together. Thanks, Dave, that's great. 
So uh, a few other questions, and, and you already mentioned um, Vermont, and I think we actually have Vermont and Maine folks on this um, webinar. And the one question is, does Maine have more old growth than New Hampshire? And I would probably um, ask about Vermont at the same time. Well, we'll, we'll start with Maine. Uh, of course, Maine is a much larger state than uh, you know New Hampshire and Vermont combined. And, and they do have some uh, pretty amazing old growth forest. Um, you know, closest to us, I guess you might say the, the Mahusik range, and there's some, there's some old growth forest there, but they have what's called a big reed uh, track. And, and the Nature Conservancy has, um, uh, has been managing a number of these areas. And so, yes, there are some um, pretty spectacular old growth forest. And if you, if you get me the email, I can send you, um, there's a publication that's available online. It's called Old Growth Forest in Maine. And it came out in 1989, but the information is, is still really good. Um, and it has a list of the various old growth forests. It was put out by the Maine Critical Areas Program. Oh, and that brings to mind another one in Maine. That's really cool. It's in Norway. It's called the Ordway Pines. And you can look that up. Norway, Maine. Uh, pretty, pretty cool um, forest. Nice trail that goes through it. Uh, and so, yes, there's, there's quite a few old growth forests that remain in Maine that, that were not logged off. Um, Vermont, uh, Vermont's very active, you know, Vermont Land Trust, Vermont Audubon, and other organizations. Uh, you know, one of the earliest ones that was recognized, very small, about 15 acres, it's Gifford Woods State Park near Killington Ski Area. And that's a, right by the road, and they have a nice nature trail that's through there. Um, and, and then there's several other uh, old growth forests. Um, uh, some of us took a course on uh, old growth forest in, in Vermont this last summer. It's a two-day course that the North Branch Nature Center offers. Um, they have a biodiversity university uh, every summer, and uh, old growth was one of them. And so we visited a number of these <clears throat> beautiful old growth forests in, in Vermont, including some right on Lake Champlain, uh, Wilmarth Woods, uh, was one, and um, if you do a you know Google search on old growth forest in, in Vermont, you'll you'll find lots of information. Liz Thompson from the Vermont Land Trust and and some of the other foresters that are in the state, they're very active in uh, studying these forests. So um, lots of information out there, wonderful places to see, and and a lot of them are so different than what you have in New Hampshire because you know Vermont has tends to have more of the enriched sites, calcareous soils. So you're, you're seeing some different trees and you're seeing you know, some, certainly some different flora on the ground. It also has some interesting clay plain forest over in the Champlain Valley. And of course Thanks, the David. Adirondacks, if, if you get in the Adirondacks, there's, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of acres of old growth forest that are over there. So Deborah asks about the threat of pests such as woody Woolly adelgid, is that a yeah, big threat? That, yeah, that's a big threat. You know, particularly in our, our hemlock forest and in, in, in down in um, um, Pisgah State Park, you know, there's, there's pockets, really nice pockets of old growth forest and a lot of it is hemlock. And the hemlock woolly adelgid, one of these exotic invasive pests that's coming in, it's present at Pisgah. It's, in particular, it, it wipes out the you know, the little seedlings and, and, and uh, saplings, you know, first, these older trees tend to be more resistant. They can often last eight to 10 years, but the problem in here in Chesterfield Gorge, for instance, which has a high percentage of, um, of hemlock, you know, what's going to happen when the hemlock woolly adelgid goes through there? It's going to be a, you know, total force change. You're probably going to see more red maple, more beech coming in, and certainly more pine so that's a that's a real concern. You know, forest health is a big thing. One thing we do find, though, is that some of these old growth forests they tend to be more resistant. These trees are are pretty tough, pretty gnarly, and they've they've held on for a while. So uh, 
hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll make it through. But, you know, hemlock woolly adelgid, balsam woolly adelgid, it's a problem that we're seeing. Uh, um, emerald ash borer, uh, you know, these things are, are really harmful. And that's why we need to get the public involved so that they can actually find these things, detect it, and we might be able to do something about some of these, some of these pests. Good question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so Lane is wondering, how can one nominate a place to be protected as old growth? And to follow up, how can we protect forests so that they can someday become old growth? Um, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I would say is go to the Old Growth Forest Network website, which is on that resource page that will be going out to you. And there's uh, information on, on how to nominate them. And so these county coordinators that we have, in various counties, uh, you get in touch with them, and they will uh, they will go out and work with you, and uh, and take a look at these particular forest and to see that. Um, now that's that part of it. Uh, the other part is you know there's 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 public lands, for instance, state parks, state forest, national forest, national wildlife refuge. You working with the land managers and the agencies to uh, you know to seek protection for them. That that's real important too. Um, and and the next part though, a little bit controversial, but there is actually some management that goes on. I, I'm actually in favor of it because you know we have so little that we need to have more. Professor Bill Keaton out of University of Vermont and some of the others, uh, Tony D'Amato is a, a, a forester there and some people out of UMass, they're actually looking for active ways to create the structure, which is so important for old growth forest. And I put some references in there, including one was a podcast from Bill Keaton from Northern Logger um, on, on how old growth characteristics can be created. And in some forests, you know, it's a little bit easier. You know, if a forest has only been, you know, had some light thinning, you know, maybe 20% of the trees had been taken out 50 years ago or 80 years ago, you know, it's gonna be a lot easier to go than starting with scratch with something was, you know, totally liquidated. And, and that's gonna take a lot longer, maybe, you know, 200 years, 250 years to get those characteristics. But uh, look into the, you know, management for old growth characteristics on my resource list and, and you will learn quite a bit about it. And, um, and, and there's some, there's some good videos that are out there too. So you, you can learn more about it too. Thanks, David. There are a couple of specific questions. Susan's wondering if there's any old growth in the Monadnock region. Well, um, the, uh, yeah, certainly there is. And um, I, I, I think Pisca State Park, is that, would that can be considered to be in the Manadnock region? I know you can pretty well see it from there. Um, um, so that would be one. Um, there's you know, several patches at Pisca. Um, and I don't know that area as well as I do in the Northern three counties of New Hampshire. Uh, but I'm sure there is, and I, I know that we just need to get out there and do more because there's some, there's certainly some land that's very difficult to get at, whether it was now or 200 years ago. Um, uh, but if you know of an area, you know, you can, you can certainly try nominating it and, and uh, we'll, we'll go out and take a look at it and, uh, and see if it meets the criteria or what it's going to take to, uh, to do that. Um, you know, in large part, a lot of people have, um, uh, oh, I'm just thinking of another place. Uh, there is another, um, I think it's a four society, uh, Madam uh, something or other <laughs> forest down there. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, but uh, I do know that there's some old growth forest that's there. And Kai asked, was the old growth white pan stand in Ringe blown down? I can't answer that because I don't know. And, and that's always a you know interesting question. There was a place in Connecticut that I knew pretty well. It was called Cathedral Pines in the northwest part of the state. It was one of the most impressive white pine stands around. And in the mid '80s, it, I understand it blew down, but part of it is still there. So even though you know it's, it, a lot of it was blown down, there's a lot of down woody material that was there. And so 
you know, is it still an old growth forest? And in, in, in many ways it is because you still have some of the trees that are left, they're coming in and you have a lot of these, these down trees. So uh, just needs to be looked at closely. And uh, I try not to be a purist because, um, you know, you don't want to, uh, what's the old saying there? You don't want to uh, go for the perfect when you can go for the, go for the good. And uh, it, in time, you know, especially if we keep talking about it in, in time in 10, 20 years, uh, you know, a lot of these forests, I think, will move into that. And particularly on the White Mountain National Forest and, and the way their, their uh, land management areas are a lot of the lands that are considered montane above 2,700 feet. You know, a lot of that's going to go into uh, potentially old growth forest and won't be logged in the future. Thanks. So one last question, David, sure. from William asks, could you please talk about high elevation old trees in New Hampshire? Yeah, uh, uh, and it's interesting that logging went uh, in some cases up to 4,000 feet in elevation uh, that we've, we've found evidence, you know, that they, they just logged, you know, from, from the, uh, basically from the bottom up and kept rolling the logs on down and they, you know, right up to the very highest points. But there are, a large number of places um, that are, uh, you know, subalpine that were were never harvested, and, and a lot of the trees there, of course, are balsam fir, but also black spruce and um, mountain paper birch, Betula cordifolia, and and these trees were, were never logged and and could be above 200 years uh, of age, but they're pretty, uh, they're pretty um, short and that, but you know, obviously they're still worth protecting because that crumb holds, that German word for crooked wood, uh, you know, these, these, are, these are pretty old. I mean, there's even some alpine plants that are woody plants that probably are 200 years old too. And I don't think I mentioned the fact that we have black gum. This is low elevation site. We have one that's 710 years old. Can you imagine that? It's the oldest broadleaf tree in the Eastern United States and that's in New Hampshire. So uh, that's black gum, Nyasa sylvatica. Uh, pretty neat uh, species. So black gum is, uh, uh, you know, the swamps, they're not big, but, uh, but they're pretty neat. But high elevation forest, you know, obviously we, we you know, they hold, the, they hold everything else together and, uh, and they're important. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, Mildred shared that Chesterfield Gorge is in the Monadnock region and it's the Madame Sherry Castle. That's the one. Oh. That's the one. Yeah. 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 So Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, David. This was great. Really appreciate you sharing all your expertise with us. And, and, and if there's any other questions, you know, feel free to send them to me and I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer them in the next couple of days. And, uh, and check out that resource list. And um, I really appreciate everyone's interest in that and having New Hampshire Audubon invite me um, um, here this evening to talk about the connections to the natural world, particularly old growth forest. Thanks, David. I'm going to share it back to Slater so he can wrap us up with an actual face and appreciate everyone's interest and really appreciate you taking the time to share all this great information with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks everyone again for your interest in our Exploring Connection series hosted by the New Hampshire Audubon uh, and supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council. Um, I'll be sending out a link uh, for an evaluation survey for this webinar. Uh, your feedback is really important to us. Uh, and as we continue to host these types of talks, it's really helpful in reporting back to our funder. Um, the next talk in this series will take place on December 15th, uh, featuring Paul Dosher from the Society of uh, Protecting New Hampshire Forests regarding conserving land, um, New Hampshire's uh, history and today. So uh, please visit our website to register for that and all the rest of the upcoming talks. Um, thank you again to David for presenting this evening. Uh, and thank you, Diane, for organizing this series. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in and learning alongside us. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again at the webinars in the near future and uh, for ways to get involved as a member, a uh, volunteer, or a donor, please visit us at newhampshireaudubon.org, nhaudubon.org. Um, thanks again. Have a great night and uh, 
have a good holiday.